Good morning. So good to see you here today. We've had a great week of Bible school. Um, I was uh, I was just so impressed with the, the children, the young people that came, <clears throat> how faithful they were night after night, and uh, to see all of the the different ones in the church that were here ahead of time preparing everything and um, then each night ministering faithfully in all the different capacities uh, those kind of ministries we say well you know we don't know how much that's right we don't only eternity will tell what impact that ministry and similar ministries will have we think of that often as the children that we have ministered to through the years, some from very difficult homes, some that we didn't see them again, we haven't seen them for years and years, but I expect when we get into heaven, we will meet some of those ones that were children uh, that heard the gospel and responded to Jesus Christ in faith. So thank you to all who, who had a part in that. I think it was a very a good week, and I appreciate that ministry very much. <clears throat> I also appreciate, as I have said several times from this pulpit, I appreciate the ministry of Brother Joe McNally, Joe and Becky, uh, for so many years here at this church. And I, I, at the interim pastors conference that we had down in South Carolina, I, I said something to that effect that it makes it very easy to come in as an interim when you've had that kind of foundation laid. And so I know... You people that uh, that know the McNallys, I, I don't need to introduce the speaker this morning. You know him far better than I do, and I am looking forward very greatly to uh, the ministry of the Word through this faithful servant. Before we hear from him, though, we're going to have scripture reading in Acts chapter 9, <clears throat> and then I'll have prayer, and I will not say more about him. He can come after the prayer and preach. We will be observing the Lord's table at the close of our service, uh, so be prepared for that as well. <clears throat> so our scripture reading in Acts chapter 9, <clears throat> we'll read the first six verses together. You follow as I read. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, this passage never grows old to hear of this marvelous transformation this, that took place on the road to Damascus in the life of the man who became the Apostle Paul demonstration of your great power to save. We praise God that that power is available to us today as well. And throughout this building, this auditorium, there are those who could give a testimony of the, the power of the gospel to save and to change. We're thankful that you are still in the saving business, that we have a Savior who never runs out of power. He, his death is as powerful, as able today to save as it was in the time of the Apostle Paul. We're thankful that we can come together in his name. What a privilege to be able to 
sit together, to worship together, to fellowship together with believers, with the body of Christ and this local church. You have built this church, Lord. You have preserved it. You have brought it to this place through these years, and we praise you for your work. We know that what you have begun, you will continue. We trust you, Lord, for the next step in the, in the needs of this ministry as you provi provide the man of your choice to be the next pastor, full-time pastor here at, uh, at this church. We know that you are working, Lord. Your timing is always right, and we trust you. Give us your grace. Give us wisdom in knowing your will in this matter. As we meet here, we are mindful that there are bodies of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ meeting either right now, some have met earlier times, some will meet after us, but we are all part of that great body of Christ. We have the same Lord, the same Savior. We are thankful for the, the unity we have in the Spirit with believers around the world. And we are, we know that your plan for the, for the earth, for the world in this time is the building of your church. We pray that your work would go forward in great power as the word of God is preached from pulpits across this land and in other countries. May it go forth in great power. May it accomplish in us and in the hearers everywhere what you intend to do. Change hearts, change lives, change us, we pray, to be more like Jesus Christ. There's some from our church family who are not able to be with us today. Lord, we ask for your special grace, some that physically cannot be here because of weakness or sickness. Grant your, your special strength and comfort and help to them. Others that are away today, this is a very uh, busy time for vacations and travel and you have been so kind and gracious to provide safety and many miles for members of our church family already. And we trust that you will protect these who are away. We pray for the, the McNallys and their travels and their plans <clears throat> uh, as they make their way out to Kansas to minister in the church there in, in uh, McPherson, Kansas. Lord, use them in a great way. Give uh, special wisdom in leading that needy church through this difficult time. Thank you for their willingness to go and just uh, pave the way before them, Lord. Prepare hearts that they, the people there will be willing to accept their ministry among them. We would, would pray also for our nation as we are commanded in your word to pray for those in authority over us. Lord, we know that our nation is in very, very bad way. We have wickedness abounding. And yet, we know that you are still in control. That you will accomplish your, your work. That you can work even through ungodly leaders. And many of our leaders are, are ungodly. They do not pretend to, to uh, follow you. But you can accomplish your will in spite of them. We pray that righteousness would be exalted in this land. Because sin is a reproach to any people. So we lift up our leaders, our president, members in Congress, the, the judges in the various courts, others in great positions of leadership, the leaders in our military branches. Lord, they, they hold responsibility for the lives of many people. Give them your wisdom. Direct their thoughts. Direct their decisions. We we commit this country to you, asking for your mercy. We ask for revival, for a stirring among your people that we would see uh, turning to you again, as has happened different times in the past. But for us today, Lord, we, we commit ourselves to the study, to the preaching of the word of God, and ask that you would use your word to accomplish in us what you desire. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. One of the things that uh, there are a lot of things that we miss 
about uh, Faith Bible Church and Winstead, Connecticut, and uh, and you folks. But one of the things that I really miss is uh, this uh, preaching area here. Uh, when we were up in Rochester, they had this uh, little thing that sort of shot out from the, you know, and then you had steps going down there. And every Sunday morning and every Sunday night, I was afraid I was going to fall off of the, uh, the steps, you know, because I don't always watch where I'm walking whenever I'm preaching. And, you know, you just uh, have those things. Then down in uh, South Carolina, I have preached, a, uh, I think one time, maybe two times, at the church that we attend down there. And they have this great big tall thing that has this little thing out on top of it. And there's like three or four steps that you can fall down off of that one. And, and, I, <coughs> and, uh, and the other thing I, uh, I really like is the opportunity to stand here like this. And so I put those up there so that I wouldn't kick that off and, and uh, have you think about me kicking this furniture around as opposed to uh, what we're going to, uh, to say. So I say all that by, to, uh, to say this. Good morning, everyone. It's good to, uh, good to see you, good to be here. Uh, Lord willing, we're going to stay till uh, Wednesday, unless Ryan gets uh, tired of us and uh, kicks us out before that. I'm not sure about uh, how, that would, uh, how that would go with Finley and Avery, but uh, uh, <coughs> as long as uh, he is allowing us to stay, we're going to be here till Wednesday. And uh, then we're going to uh, over to New York, and uh, our uh, third grandson is going to get married. Andy's getting married next uh, Saturday, so we're excited about uh, being a part of that. And then uh, the next Sunday, a week from today, we're headed off to uh, Kansas, as uh, uh, Pastor Clint has already mentioned. We're going to uh, be uh, interim pastor of a church in uh, McPherson, excuse me, McPherson, Kansas. It's called Wheatland Baptist Church. And we would just, uh, certainly appreciate your prayers for us as we go there and, uh, and start that ministry. And uh, we're not sure how long we're going to, uh, to be there, but we appreciate you uh, praying for us as we, uh, as we go there. Uh, it's good to see some uh, faces that I haven't seen for a long, 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 long. I mean, most of I, you know, I've seen in February, but uh, it's good to see uh, Tim uh, if you remember, we prayed for Tim for a long time, going through all of his uh, bone marrow being taken out and then being uh, treated, bone marrow put it back in again. And, uh, and I heard, this is uh, the rumor, well, it's not a rumor that uh, the Lord's blessed him and given him strength and help, but the rumor is that in the midst of all this trials and tribulations, he saw the error of his way, stopped being a Dallas Cowboy fan, and now roots for the Steelers. Is that true, Tim? <laughs> All we can say about that is hokey hen. I just can't believe, uh, can't believe that. But it's great to see Tim and uh, Tim and Pat, and it's good to see Junith. I haven't seen Junith for many years, and uh, it's good to see her and uh, doing well. And uh, every time I see Junith, I always think back to uh, whenever we had the uh, the fellowship hall uh, right back there. And they would bring uh, snacks for us to have after uh, after uh, church. How many of you remember the snacks after church? <coughs> one family said to me uh, one uh, time, and they said, "Boy, those uh, snacks are a good reason to come to Faith Bible Church." So that was uh, an interesting uh, interesting situation. But uh, we uh, it's good to be here. Uh, good to be able to share with you, and uh, looking forward to uh, sharing the word and a little bit of fellowship after the after the service today. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians. We're going to jump around to uh, a bunch of different places this morning, but we're going to start out in, uh, <coughs> start out in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So if you just uh, turn there, that's where we'll, uh, that's where we'll start. Uh, the sermon I'm going to preach today is a little different than my normal sermon uh, because it's, you know, I'm not going to be here for a period of time, so we're not going to go through... Uh, uh, a uh, series of anything, and uh, so I just wanted to share with you something that uh, just uh, uh, spoke to me, uh, oh, I don't know, probably a couple of months ago. We went out to uh, Kansas. One of the things that you usually do whenever you have, uh, you're starting an interim ministry is that the people at the church want to check you out and see if you, uh, they like you and want you to come and be their interim pastor. And you as the interim pastor, you want to go and check them out and see if you like them and you want to go there to be the interim pastor. And so 
we went out to, uh, to Kansas. Uh, Becky and I flew out to uh, Kansas, I think, on a Thursday. And we stayed till uh, Tuesday, you know, met with the church, met with the families, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Had a fellowship meal, and uh, it's really important to have a fellowship meal. You want to check out the food, you know, what kind of cooks you have in the, in the church. And, and so we, uh, <coughs> we did all of, uh, all of those things. And then after uh, we'd gone back, uh, back home, back to South Carolina, uh, one of the deacons called me up on, uh, on the phone, and uh, he wanted to chit-chat about some, uh, some different things. And he said, uh, uh, he said, Pastor, he said, would it be okay if I shared with you my, uh, my testimony? I said, sure, that would be great. I said, I love to, to hear how God has worked in, uh, in different people's lives uh, through, the, through the years. And, and he said, well, he said, I grew up in, uh, in a church here in, uh, in Kansas, and uh, whenever I was young, I don't know, maybe... Uh, uh, four years old, five years old, six years old, something, uh, something like that. He said, "I don't know. We were at a, a youth kind of uh, kind of thing." And he said, "And I and I prayed a prayer to uh, you know to receive the Lord Jesus as my uh, as my Savior." And he said, uh, "So all the time that I you know went through the the rest of my uh, uh, elementary age and into uh, into high school, he said I always." Uh, I always believed that I uh, knew Jesus as my Savior, that I was on my way to, uh, to heaven. And, and he said, I just, uh, you know, trusted in the fact that I had, you know, I had prayed and I'd received the Lord as my, uh, as my Savior. He said, then I uh, left Kansas. He said, I moved down, to, uh, moved down to Florida. And he said, when I moved down to, uh, to Florida, he said, I got involved in a bunch of things that I, I shouldn't have gotten involved in and lived a life that I shouldn't, uh, you know, a, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ shouldn't, uh, shouldn't live. And he said, uh, uh, I saw that that was really wrong. He said, so I went back to church again. And he said, you know, when I went back to church again, you know, I began to, to listen to with uh, uh, maybe a, a different uh, ear, maybe a different perspective, maybe a different idea. And he said, and I realized after I had uh, gone back to church again, he said, I, <coughs> the Lord convicted me of my, of my sin. And he said, and I realized that I really, I really wasn't a believer in the Lord. He said, I know that I had prayed a prayer whenever I was young, but he said, I'd never really trusted the Lord Jesus as my, uh, as my Savior. And he said, so I trusted Christ as my Savior. And he said, oh, what a change he made in my life. You know, he went, uh, you know, he went from, uh, you know, all the things that I was interested in and thinking about and involved in. He said, you know, God just turned me around and, and I began to follow after, uh, after the Lord. And, and God had just made such a remarkable change in my, uh, in my life, make a remarkable change in my spirit. And he said, and he said, I just wanted to share out with you because that's so important to, to me because of you know so many times you know people that uh, you know receive the, the Lord when they're young they uh, you know they don't have that uh, you know that insurance of their transformation they have made and so this morning that's what I'd like to talk about I'd like to talk about sort of like the difference between what it's like to, to be saved as an adult and the difference and and somebody who is saved as a as, as a child somebody who is uh, who is young and so let's start out with the easy one first let's start out with people that are uh <clears throat> that are saved as adults okay usually a uh, person who is saved as an adult can look at first corinthians excuse me second corinthians chapter five let's just look at the uh, the verse there and realize in second corinthians chapter five it says this therefore if any man be in christ he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now, let's just think about this for a second. Whenever God does something, there's evidence of God's working. When God does something, there's radical changes that take place. When God does something, you know, you can see it's a God thing. Okay, let me just list you a couple of things that I wrote down. We think about the, the creation of the, uh, of the world. You know, God, you know, uh, who else could take from nothing and make all of the things that are on this, uh, this world? And not only create all the things that are in this world, but how intricately those things in this world fit together and work together and, and uh, you know, and continue on. You know, just think about the, you know, the earth spinning and you think of the solar system and you, and you think about, uh, you know, water. Who would have ever thought of making something that, you know, would freeze in the wintertime and, and be a vapor when it gets real hot and, and being to be a liquid? You know, who would ever think of something like that and how powerful that is? 
in our in our day-to-day life and so when god creates something when in the creation you can see the evidence that you know this is god doing something whenever you think about reading through the scriptures and you think about the uh, the flood okay and the evidence that we have in uh fossils and all those kind of things from a, from a flood that, uh, that took place, you recognize that, you know, here was a, a, a God who, you know, opened up the heavens and, you know, put all this water upon the, uh, uh, upon the earth, and you, you see God's hand in that and saving this, you know, this small group of people in the midst of that. You think about the, uh, the beginning of the, the creation that everybody spoke the same language and then you get to uh to genesis chapter 11 and what does god do god confuses all of the languages and just think how strange that is right how have you ever tried to talk to somebody uh i remember when andre used to come to uh, to church here uh he would walk by the the front of the church and he didn't speak very much uh very much english and i spoke no spanish at all and he would walk uh he would walk by the the front of the the church and and he would say something uh, something to me and i didn't have any idea what he was uh, what he was saying but he would speak louder as if you know it being louder i would be able to understand what he was uh, what he was saying but we didn't communicate because we had different languages and you see you know the the hand of god in that you know making that change that judgment that came upon the earth and the evidence of god you know making all of these different languages you think of the choosing of abraham and and how god has you know put his hand upon the uh, the jewish people and the nation of israel all of these uh, all of these years and and uh, how he has kept them even though they haven't had their own land for many many years that god kept them and allowed them to uh, to go forward and prosper and then you think about you know god creating this wonderful thing that we call the church okay there was no churches previous to, uh, you know, to Acts chapter 2. And God created this wonderful thing called the church that has spread all over all of the world and, and continues to spread and develop. And you see the hand of God on all of these things. And so thinking about that, when you think about the fact that when God's hand is upon something, when God's working in something, when God is involved in something, you know, there's evidence that God is doing something. And that same thing is true whenever you think about salvation. Okay? Because what is salvation? Salvation is taking that person who is lost and dead in their trespasses and sin, convicting them of that sin, giving them a, a gospel message, a message of hope, and they repent of the way that they have lived their lives and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And how they do that? By faith. For by grace are we saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And what is this thing that we call faith? And I have said this probably a million times from this, uh, from this pulpit. Faith is an assurance and conviction that what God said is true. Okay? Assurance and conviction that, you know, this, this, this book that God has given to us, this is true, and we act upon it. There's a, there's a re, uh, response to that, uh, to that, uh, that words that God has spoken. And so we think about the, uh, the fact that God has spoken these words and we respond to those kinds, of, uh, those kinds of things. And so we, as people who are adults, you know, you can probably, all of us who are saved here as an adult, we can look back to a, a time in our life where we know that we were lost. We knew that we were dead in our trespass and sin. And we can say, well, I heard the gospel or I read a tract or I listened to somebody preach on the TV, or, or my friend shared the message with me, and, and I know that, you know that I was different after I put my faith and trust in that message, that gospel message that God has sent to me. We know that there's a difference, there's a change that took place in my life. I said, I went from being this person who was dead, and now I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that he has changed my life. I can see it, it's very evident. And that's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's a new creature. He said, Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And you can look back and say, I know when the old time was, and I know when the new started. Right? We have that testimony. Now, turn over, if you would, to the book of uh, Acts chapter 16, and I want you to see how evident this is in the lives of a couple of different people in the scriptures. Acts chapter 16, if you remember, is where uh, Paul was in uh, Rome, excuse me, Paul was in uh, 
uh, Philippi, and he was in uh, he was in jail. Remember, he went there and uh, <coughs> he was preaching, and uh, uh, the the servant lady she got saved, and and she was uh, you know not uh, doing the divination those things anymore, and and so the people that controlled her got all upset and said you know let's put these guys in jail. They're you know they're heretics and they're doing all these strange things. And so Paul and Silas, they, uh, they went to jail. And, you know, they did the same thing all of us do whenever we go to jail, right? They're singing praises and, you know, worshiping the Lord and saying, Woo, isn't that great what God is doing? How many of you have been to jail? Well, we don't want to ask you that question. <laughs> but the truth is, uh, you know, the truth is what? That their response to going to jail was, you know, just, just amazing. That here they are, they're worshiping God, even though they had been put into jail for, you know, for, uh, you know, these horrible reasons that they're but they're there so they were there worshiping the lord and then notice what it says in verse uh uh, uh let's start reading in verse 28 it says paul cried out with a loud voice now this is after the earthquake their bonds had fallen off paul cried out with a, vo- a loud voice do thyself no harm for we're all here because the jailer had been told what that you know if any of these guys get out you are in big trouble he says then they called for a light verse 29 and sprang in and came trembling, and they fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, these are, you know, like once-in-a-lifetime uh, opportunities, right? You hardly ever have anybody come to you and say, you know, what must I do to be saved? You know, tell me how I can have everlasting life. You know, usually you have to start the conversation, but here, you know, there's a background that has been laid, and the... Uh, uh, the jailer says, uh, you know, there's something different about these guys that, you know, that God is working here and, you know, they, they, uh, all our bonds are broken, the doors are down, and, and yet these guys didn't escape. You know, what's, what's going on here? You know, how can I have this, this same relationship with God that you guys, uh, you guys have? And he says, he brought, he brought them out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved in your house. So what did they do? He says, you know, believe, put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe this, this message that the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth and he died on the cross and he rose again from the dead. And if you trust in him, you will have everlasting life. God will come into your life. He'll change you. He'll make you a new creature. Now, I realize that, uh, you know, we don't have everything that Paul said here, but he explains to him what he needs to do. He needs to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice the response of the jailer. It says in verse 31, And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord and all that were in the house. You know, there are more to it than just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They explained to him the gospel message. And notice what happens. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his immediately. And when he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced, be, believing in God with all of his house. Okay, notice what happened. He got, they got baptized. He he took the people out of jail that he was supposed to be doing what? That he was supposed to be watching. He took them all to to his house. Now, can you imagine the phone call? He calls his wife up and says, honey, I'm bringing some of the inmates over for, uh, you know, for baptism and and, uh, we're going to, you know, clean them up from the stripes that we put on them and and we're going to, uh, you know, give them something to eat and we're all going to have a shout and hallelujah time. And, and. The wife says, what? Have you lost your mind? Are you crazy? You know, what, what in the world's going on here? But you can see that this, this faith did what? Made a radical change in the Philippian jailer's life. And so he brought these men over to, uh, you know, to his house, and, and uh, uh, he was converted and saved and baptized, and, and you know, his life was changed. He's a new creature because what? Because God came into his life. God changed him. God worked in his heart. Let's go on. Another beautiful illustration, Acts chapter 9. This is the one that uh, Pastor Clint led, uh, excuse me, read, and it's all about the Apostle Paul. Okay, now we know what kind of a guy the Apostle Paul was. He was a a nasty guy as far as the church went, that he was seeking to have the, the church, the people, the followers of the way, have them destroyed and have them stopped you know, have them no more preaching this. You know, this doesn't go along with Judaism and, and all the things that we have been learned and we have been taught. And so we're going to stop this. You know, we're just going to, you know, put, the, put an end to this. Verse, nine, verse 1 of chapter 9. 
And it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. And he desired of him letters to Damascus and to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, now this way is the people that are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. If he found any of these believers in the Lord, he says, any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. That we can take them, we can, uh, uh, you know, we can tie them up, we can bring them back to Jerusalem so that we can deal with them, uh, deal with them here. We can, uh, you know, torture them, we can kill them, we can, you know, we can get rid of this. We can squash this way, get rid of these people. So he went there and he said to him, you know, give us some papers that we have to do this. So we have the authority to bring these people back bound. Verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shone around about him a light from heaven. Okay, now again, just picture yourself. You know, here you are, you're walking along with Apostle Paul, and all of a sudden, you know, this great light from, uh, you know, from heaven. You know, it's not just the sunshine, but, you know, just a powerful light came down that, you know, that stopped them uh, in what they were doing. He says, and uh, uh, this uh, light fell down, and he says, and he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, now that's Paul's name before he was converted. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Here was the Lord himself speaking to the Apostle Paul. Now, uh, <clears throat> probably all of us, whenever we got saved, we didn't have the Lord speaking the way the Apostle Paul does, but, but God left us a record of how he spoke to people and, and our need for salvation. And so we take this as the, as the word of God. And he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Verse 5 said, and he says, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you persecuted. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And he, trembling and astonished, says, Lord, what will you have me to do? Okay? Again, you talk about a radical change in a person's life, right? Here's a guy who is on his way to Damascus. We're going to catch these people that are part of the way. We're going to tie them up. We're going to drag them back to Jerusalem. We're going to, you know, we're going to get rid of these people. And he turned around because he was confronted by the Lord himself. And what does he say? He says, Lord, what do you want me to do? A radical change took place in his life. Now, I want you to notice this. He says, uh, <clears throat> verse number, uh, number six. Verse, uh, yeah, verse number six. He trembling and astonished says, Lord, what will we have me to do? And notice what the Lord says. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what you must do. That's what the King James says. He says, you know, you go into the city, and it's going to be told you what you must do. Okay? Now notice here is the Lord doing what? He's putting requirements on Paul's life. He, Paul, he says, Paul, this is what's going to happen. And he goes on and talks about, you know, the persecution and the strugglings and the sufferings that he's going to do, the hard times, the, the hard things that are going to happen in the, the life of the Apostle Paul. But yet here's the Apostle Paul. He's doing what? He said, what do you have me to do? God made a radical change in his, uh, in his life. Turn over, if you would, to the book of uh, 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we get just a, a little inkling here of, uh, of what has taken place. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, But ye are a generation, but excuse me, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, we're not going to go through this whole verse, but I want you to see here what, what God is talking about. He says, you know, you have, are now a royal priesthood. He says, you are now a, 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 a holy nation. You are now a people of his own. So that you can do what? Show forth his praises. Okay? And you get the picture here of what he's saying. He's saying, you know, once a person puts their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that God just makes a, a, a tremendous revolution in their lives changes them transforms them into his children now for all of us that are 
believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who have gotten saved after we were adults, we can look back at a time like that. We can look back at a time when, when we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and he changed us. He made us, he made us new creatures. We can look back at that and say, and we can recognize that our faith that we put in the gospel message and the word of God in the Lord Jesus Christ, our, our faith that we put in him did what? It has made a change in our lives. We're, we're now new creatures. We're new people. We're, we're different than we were before, never to go back again. Okay? And so we have this to look back and say, you know, sometimes if you ever have any doubt of your, of your salvation or your, you know, you're struggling with things, you look back and say, wow, you know, God has changed me from what I was to what I am now. He has made me a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God for all the things that he have done. And again, the key is what? Faith and assurance and conviction. What God said is true. Okay. This gospel message that God has shared with me and I believed it. I have acted upon it. I have trusted him as my savior. Now, those are the easy ones. What about somebody and there are people that are seated in this room that put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus whenever they were just children, four years old, five years old, six years old, seven years old. They have lived in the church basically all of their lives, grew up in the, in the faith, and never really had that, uh, you know, that, that conversion experience that many of us as adults have had you know, what, what do you look back at? What do you, what do you, what do you do? What's the, you know, what kind of a assurance do you have that, you know, that God has really worked in my life and, and given me this new birth? And again, our assurance of our salvation is based upon our, our trust and our faith that we have put in the, the living God. Well, one of the things that we could do to solve this problem is never share the gospel with little kids, Right? We could say, you know, whenever you get big enough, then we're going to give you the, the gospel message. We're going, to, we're going to help you to find Jesus whenever you get to be, you know, whenever I can see you eyeball to eyeball. Well, obviously, God doesn't want us to do that, right? I mean, you read through scriptures, and, and it says, uh, you know, fathers do what? Bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Uh, the Bible says, uh, train up a child in the way he should go. The Bible says, uh, Jesus said, don't forsake the little ones to come unto me. So obviously, uh, the Lord wants us to reach young people. And one of the blessings of reaching young people is the fact that they don't get into some of the garbage that you and I, who were adults when we got saved, got into. They don't get into some of the, the difficulties and the, and the struggles that, uh, that go on. So what do we do? How do we, how do we handle this situation? How do we have, as a person who grew up as being saved at a young age and grow up, uh, you know, what, what do we have to look at? How do we know from a, you know, from a very practical way that I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? How do I know in a very practical way that God is working in and through me now? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I knew you were thinking about that whenever you came. And so I'm glad you asked that, uh, that question this morning because I have a, an answer that I'd like to share with you. There's an interesting uh, uh, phrase that God has put into the, uh, into the scriptures. Uh, it's in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. It's in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. It's in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11. It's in uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse, verse 38. And you have heard it multiple times. It says this, the just shall live by faith. Okay, the just shall live by faith. The just would be the people that are uh, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, that have the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ because they have put her faith, their faith in him. He says these, these just people, these righteous people, these believing people, what do they do? They live by faith. Okay, now, many times people have a, uh, I think a, uh, a wrong picture of what it means to live by faith. Uh, a number of years ago, whenever we, uh, <coughs> I was sharing this story with a, uh, with a man, I don't even remember who, uh, who it was or what time it was, but whenever we moved from uh, uh, Arkansas after we had finished Bible college back to, uh, back to Pennsylvania, I had a job working in a factory for a period of time, and, and Christmas, uh, it was just about Christmas time, 
I got laid off from this, uh, this job. So I did what every normal self-respecting person did. I went down and to collect unemployment. And so my unemployment was based upon what I made in Arkansas, where I hardly worked at all because I was going to Bible college. And so they said, wow, you know, your salary from unemployment each week is going to be $50. Now, I know $50 went a lot more back in those days than it does in these days, but still, $50 is $50. You don't buy much with a wife and three kids in a house and all that kind of stuff on $50. And so I was sharing this story about how, you know, God took care of us uh, in the midst of all these things. And this guy said to me, he said, wow, you really had to live by faith then. And I thought, what do you mean? You have to live by faith all the time. You don't just, you know, you just don't live by faith when you only get fifty dollars because, you know, whenever you get, uh, you know, a thousand dollars a week, you don't have to live by faith anymore. You know, it's not based upon that. What is living by faith? What are we talking about whenever we're talking about living by faith? What does what does that mean? How do we how do we have a picture of that? So I thought, well, let's have some fun with uh, with this, and let me ask you a question: How many of you are living by faith today? Raise your hand. Nice and high so we can see the people that aren't uh, living by faith. Okay? What do we mean when we're talking about living by faith? Well, we take our same definition of faith, right? An assurance and conviction that what God said is true, and we act upon it. We live that, live that out, okay? So let's, uh, let's illustrate. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. We all know it, right? Let's sing it together. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That's enough. <laughs> but the verse is what? We rejoice in the Lord, and how often do we rejoice in the Lord? Always, right? And so a person who is living by faith, God said to rejoice in the Lord always, so what am I doing? I'm rejoicing in the Lord always, right? Right? That's the idea of living by faith. That's what God said in his word, and I'm going to live that out practically by rejoicing in the Lord always. Okay, that's an easy one. Let's turn over to the book of uh, Ephesians. Let's look at some hard ones. We like the hard ones, right? Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 4. Let's look, at, uh, let's look at verse 32. There's a couple of them uh, in there. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. Okay, Ephesians 4, 32. Notice what Paul says by the inspiration of Scripture. He says what? And be kind one to another. Are you kind to the people you come in contact with? Or you're only kind to the people who are kind to you? Or you're only kind to the, to the people who are doing what you want them to do? Or you're only kind to the people that are attractive. Or you're only kind to, you know, no, he doesn't, doesn't classify that at, at all. He says, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted. Are you tender-hearted? And then he goes on, he says, forgiving. Are you forgiving one another? Or do you have bitterness and resentment and, and hard feelings and holding grudges against people? That's not walking by faith when you have those those kind of things. Walking by faith is doing what? Doing what the Scripture says, and we, and we put it into practice. We're living that, uh, living that way. Look at another verse in uh, chapter uh, 4 and verse 15. Chapter 4 and verse 15. He says, but speaking the truth. Many times we like to stop right there, right? But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, who is the head, even Christ. We're speaking the truth in love. Okay? We're telling the truth. You know, we're not lying. We're not coming up with, you know, trying to, you know, confuse somebody or, or put them off the wrong way. But we speak the truth in, in love. Let's go on. Chapter 5 and verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. You walk by faith when you submit yourself to your own husband. Chapter 5, verse uh, 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You're living by faith when you love your wife by giving yourself for her. Okay? And it's just, you know, it's just so, just that simple, right? 
that we take the Word of God, and whenever the Word of God gives us direction, a directive, tells us to do something, we live by faith, we put that into practice. And so that's what, what, uh, what uh, Paul was saying. He says, the just shall live by faith. Now, turn over, if you would, to the book of uh, Romans, chapter, uh, chapter 1. Does it seem like this sermon's going on for a long time? It just seems like it's, you know, it's a long sermon. <coughs> Pastor Clint said I'm getting paid by the hour, so I you know, figured I'd, uh, you know. Romans chapter 1 and verse uh, 16. What does he say? He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why am I not ashamed of the gospel of, uh, of Christ? For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, okay? So what's he saying here? He's saying this gospel message, this, this message about the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, this message that if we put our faith and trust in him, that he's going to make us a new creature, that he's going to give us eternal life, that he's going to adopt us into the family of God, that we're going to be born from above. You know, he said this message is the power of God. When we share that message with people, it changes lives. It transforms them. It makes them different people than they were before and so he says i'm not ashamed of that because it's god's power and we don't usually look at at words as being powerful but that the words of god are so powerful he says they are the power of god to everyone that believes saves jews saves greeks or gentiles you know this power works in everybody's hearts and everybody's life and then he goes on he says for it is written he says for in it is the righteousness of God revealed, okay? God's standard of righteousness is revealed in the gospel message. What is that? That God doesn't just overlook sins and cast them aside, but the sins have to be paid for, and that the Lord Jesus Christ paid that penalty for our sins because he died on the cross, he rose again from the dead, and if we put our faith and trust in him, we can have the cleansing and forgiveness of sins because this is God's plan. This is what Christ has done for us. Now, notice what he says. He says, For in it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And I thought, you know, that's interesting that he would say from faith to faith. And I think what he's saying there is that he's talking about from faith, that we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he gives us everlasting life to faith is what he has called us to do. He has called us to live a life of faith the just shall live by faith okay so faith isn't just a one-time thing that we do that we trust jesus as our savior or maybe we pray a prayer or something like uh, like that to, you know to, to have everlasting life but the idea of faith is that we live by faith in a daily basis that we trust what the lord jesus has said in his word and god the father and the prophets and whoever uh, wrote in the scriptures we trust them and we put them to practice in their practice in our day-to-day -day life and so a person who has gotten saved whether they're you know five six seven eight years old they can look at their lives and say you know am i living by faith do i trust the word of god do I trust what the Bible says? Am I seeking to implement the Word of God in my day-to-day -day life? Am I walking by faith? Because faith is the thing that saves us, but faith is also the directive of how we live our lives day after day after day. And so we stop and think about that. We say, say to ourselves, you know, am I saved? Am I a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have I trusted him as my savior? Can you look back if you got saved at an at, at, at older age? Can you look back and say, wow, this is the place when God turned my life around. And if you can say that, say, "Woo! praise the Lord, glory, hallelujah. Isn't it awesome that I have that salvation from God? But what about you as a young person? That maybe you got saved at four, five, six, seven years old. And you don't have that date that you can look back at and say, wow, you know, I, I know for sure that I'm saved because God changed me around. You can't even remember the, the experience, what took place at that time. And sometimes moms and dads don't help out very much in this, uh, in this cause, but that cause they'll say to their child, well, you remember back in, you know, whenever you were uh, two years old and, and uh, you were still in diapers and you couldn't talk very well, but, but you, you prayed this, uh, you know, you prayed this prayer. Don't you remember that? And we don't remember that. 
We need to, to recognize that we need to allow, allow our children to you know, think through and look at their faith and their own. But maybe you're here today and you were prayed to prayer whenever you're young. The question you want to ask yourself is, you know, have I trusted Christ? Am I trusting Christ right now? Not only for my salvation, but am I trusting God right now? Do I, do I have a heart's desire? Do I love the word of God? Do I know that the word of God is true? Is, is God working in my heart and my life? And maybe you're just going through the motions because this is the way that you will always live because you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior. And maybe God's speaking to you today. Say, I want to be sure that I have everlasting life. I want to be sure that I'm on my way to, uh, to heaven. I want to trust him. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. And nobody's, uh, nobody's looking around. And let me ask you all first. Do you have a, a date and a time? Do you have an experience that you know for sure that the Lord Jesus came into your life, he changed your life around and made you a new creature? Do you have that, an, an experience like that as an adult? If you do, awesome. That's, that's fantastic. But maybe you don't have that experience. Maybe you don't, haven't had that, that change, that transformation that the Lord Jesus wants to make in your life. Or maybe you're uh, a young person and you, maybe you prayed a prayer, but boy, you know, living the life is not what I've done up until this point in time. And I want to I wanna live that life. I want to have that transformation. Maybe God's speaking to you today and, and telling you, call upon the name of the Lord and, and you will be saved. Ask the Lord Jesus to be your Savior and he'll save you. Maybe you'd just like me to pray for you this morning and ask, you, ask God to help you to, to receive him as their Savior. Anyone like that? You're just not sure you're saved, but you'd like to just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure, but I'd like to be sure like to know, have a certainty of my, my relationship with God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the salvation that you give to us. It's so real. It's free to us. It costs you everything. And we thank you, God, that you have called us not only to be saved, but you have called us to walk by faith every single day. And God, we can't do that on our own. We can only do it as you supply the, the enablement for us. And we give you the praise for giving that to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brothers. We...